I've been dying to do this episode because I see boats change hands all the time for less than 10 grand that are worth three times that much. And in this video, I'm gonna tell you how to find those sort of hidden gems, but the opportunity to buy them won't come easy. You'll have to work for it. This week on everything you need to know how to find a super good deal on a good boat. We're gonna look at some boats today that are listed for less than 10 grand and see if they're even worth your time. I mean, can you really buy a sailboat that's big enough to sleep on for less than a few months worth of rent money if you live in the city? Or are you just wasting your time? But before we get started, I have something else for you guys. You guys have been so amazing and I'd really, really value you, your feedback on something I'm working on. You've helped Lady K grow to near 50,000 subscribers and it blows my mind every day when I see it. And now I've been toying with the idea of a second YouTube channel for a while now and I finally decided to pull the trigger on that project. I'll still be posting Lady K sailing videos every Friday, but I need more to express myself creatively and I think I found just the thing. Given my love for the sea and my love for history, the subject matter seemed pretty obvious if I was going to make different YouTube videos. So if you're into maritime history, I invite you to have a look and see if you like it. I'll link the new channel below in the description and you can find it at youtube.com forward slash at history. It's a pretty good name, I think. Or click up at the top right now and it'll take you there. Please watch the first episode on the Erie Canal and leave a comment on that video and let me know what you thought, what was good, what was bad. And of course, it's a brand new channel that has almost no subscribers. So if you like it, it would really mean the world to me if you subscribed, but I won't hold you to it. Okay, let's get on with it. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret that a lot of people don't know. And that is, I only paid nine grand for Lady K. To put that in perspective, she's a 35 foot Hughes from 1980 that I bought about seven years ago. When I bought her, she was listed for 30K, which sounds more reasonable. And she was just at that time repowered with a brand new Volvo three cylinder diesel and a brand new sail drive to go with it, all professionally installed with almost no hours on any of it, with the receipts in hand for the whole shebang, some $15,000 in all. And she came with good rigging and reasonably serviceable sails. So how did I do it? Let's start with what does nine grand actually get you today? What can you buy? I looked and the first boat that popped out to me was this. This is an early 80s Pearson 30 and it was just price dropped to 10 grand from 15. This thing is gonna sell. But what do we get for our 10 grand here? We get a boat with a nice size cockpit and the benefit of wheel steering. I actually race every year, multiple nights a week usually, on a Pearson 30, the same boat, except the one I race on has a tiller. So this wheel is interesting. We get some older Lumar winches, not self-tailing. They look like Lumar 30s, uh, but at least they're Lumar. So the rebuild kits are available and super cheap, and it's easy to rebuild these things. We get a fairly tidy looking deck up front, and I'm impressed to see an anchor locker. A lot of 30 footers won't give you that, and it always makes me wonder, how did they expect people to haul around all the anchor and road that they might need without an anchor locker? We get a single spreader rig and a furler, which is all basically bog standard for a 30 footer. I mentioned that I race on one of these and I think it's important to point out that we took third place overall last year. So this boat, she can move. It looks like we get a plain old mainsail cover, no lazy jacks, but we can make those if we really want them. And the running rigging looks old and tired. And I always do like to see that for a weird reason. Um, when a boat for sale has bad running rigging, it's a way to drive the price down, but never shy away from a boat with older running rigging. It's just about the cheapest and easiest thing to replace. It's just line after all. All in all, this is a nice boat. And so far, it looks like someone took the time to upgrade to a more modern Raymarine depth sounder and a speed transducer, which is good. That'll save us money. I know this boat very well, so I'm actually kind of dreading showing you the inside, but here we go. 
Actually, this one shows very nicely. We have opposing settees, which you expect to see in a 30-footer, with a flip and fold up table, but it all looks to be in very good shape. We get nice cushions and the V-berth even looks somewhat inviting. Again, weird for a 30-footer. The Pearson is of course a keel step mass, so it gets points for that. And more importantly, it has a quarter berth at the back, which is kind of a big deal on a boat like this. Having a quarter berth creates a lot of extra space inside, whether you sleep in it or store extra sails in it. It's just more room rather than those boats that just have a wall at the back. Even the head looks half decent and spacious. It's bigger than the head in my 35. And I honestly really like the inside of this boat. What more can you say to this thing? But yes, please. We also get a diesel, which is awesome considering what a 30 footer would usually have is an Atomic 4. And not that there's anything wrong with the Atomic 4. I just much rather have this Yanmar 2G. The catch with this boat is obviously the very dated wiring and electronics. But if you're looking to spend 10 grand or less, I suspect you're not going to be out navigating offshore or at night, and you won't need all that fancy pants kind of stuff. A solid depth sounder and an iPad will probably get you by just fine. If I wanted a 30 footer and I needed to spend less than 10 grand, this is certainly a contender. But I get asked a lot about boats less than 30 feet that are much more friendly to, shall we say, the less mobile maybe people getting up there in years. People who just want a nice little day sailor that the grandkids can swim off the back and they can take leisurely sailing on nice days. And whenever anyone sort of outlines that scenario to me, this boat always comes to mind. This is a Hunter 27 and it has a lot going for it. These little hunters do what Hunter does. They pack a lot into a little space, particularly where else are you going to get a sugar scoop on a 27 footer and all for less than 10 grand? They want eight for this one. And I saw one go last summer for 12. These little hunters are so easy to sail and they move along very nicely, even in a small breeze. You get a proper rig too with a backstay. And these are very cheap boats to own. They're super light. They're easy to trailer it if you need to. The parts are cheap. They're very simple. There's not a lot to go wrong here. It's even a shoal draft with a wing fin keel with the bulb on the bottom. This boat particularly does not come with a trailer. It has a cradle, but the cradle looks very adequate to be put on a flatbed and towed down the highway if you need to bring this thing somewhere else. These boats are super light too. Okay, so how did I buy Lady K for nine grand? It seems weird. Here's the deal. If you're new to sailing and you're looking for your first boat and you want to find that hidden gem of a deal, these boats won't be on Yacht World and often not even on Craigslist. These boats change hands sort of under the table. An example, in my sailing circle, we have a gentleman who had a 31 foot full keel boat. He had it for decades in our club. Sort of like an Alberg style of boat, but it wasn't an Alberg, it was a bit bigger. Um, it was sailed and used every year and had tons and tons of spare parts and extra sails. A garage full of stuff came with this boat. The man also kept a second sailboat that he owned in Florida. Um, and every winter he would go down to Florida and sail through the Bahamas and the ocean. So the man knew what he was doing. Um, as the boat sat there as is, it was worth about 20 grand. It was a solid boat. Um, one night over beers, he explained that he was retiring from sailing. He had just finished building his house and he was ready to hang up his PFD. He said, honestly, if someone gave me three grand right now, I'd probably let her go. I mean, he loved the boat, don't get me wrong, but he was in a unique position in his life where the work involved in making whatever repairs it needed and then cleaning the whole boat spick and span and then going through the trouble of actually posting it up for sale and showing it in sea trials, it wasn't worth it to him. And he didn't need the money. He was far more interested in seeing the boat go to someone who would love her as much as he did. Sailors are like that. Money isn't always our driving force. I mean, if it was, we'd probably all have power boats. Sailboats are often not powered by money. They're powered by passion. And he had passion in spades. Of course, at the mention of three grand, everyone in the room pulled out their checkbook. But not to be taken advantage of, his offer that he got on the spot was five grand. 
The point of this story is pretty obvious. Someone was in the right place with the right passion for sailing at the right time. The new owner had all three and now is the proud new owner of that boat. So if you have the passion, I'm going to explain how to get yourself into the right place at the right time. But first, I want to show you this O'Day and tell you a funny story about a scar I have from an O'Day. The same model as this, a 272. These boats are a lot of boat for the money. This one's 7,500, which is kind of a steal. We have one of these at my club and it used to be owned by my friend Chris. It's a wonderful boat. It sails very, very well. And more to its purpose, it gives you tons and tons of space inside. More than most 27 footers ever would. You can stand up in this thing. You can walk around inside. For a 27, it also even has a bathroom. The most notable feature about the O'Day 272 that you may like or might not. The most notable feature about the O'Day suit the most notable feature about the O'Day 272 that you may like is that it's a very modern looking boat. Um, it's from the late 80s, but it could be from like 2010 with all of its non-skid everywhere and its lines, the way it carries them. It's, it's modern. It looks great. The one weird part though is that the benches in the cockpit where you sit and the gunnel up on top where the winches are, are on an angle. So basically, if you sit down, the seat slopes backward toward your back to sort of keep you in the seat level when the boat is healed. But the gunnel slopes outward too. Interesting feature that you do get used to over time, I promise. But one night, Chris and I had rafted our boats off. We tied them together at anchor um, to spend the night you know, out in the lake. Uh, we had some dinner and we had beers on his boat before we both were going to turn in. When I went to hop from his boat back to my boat, I went and stepped on the, the bench that I was sitting on and then onto the gunnel, but the gunnel is sloped and not realizing that I had had a few drinks and it was dark. Um, needless to say, I landed hard in between the two boats with a stanchion in my back and I still have the scar, but it doesn't discount this boat. O'Day makes a very solid and very rumor, roomy little cruiser that you could potentially sleep on for a week or two without it actually driving you crazy and they're trailerable. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make these videos possible. I couldn't do it without you. A big shout out to all the existing patrons that have gotten us this far. Almost 50,000 subscribers, guys. It's crazy. If you get some value from these videos or you want to help out, please consider becoming a patron. Patrons get early access to videos and live streams, and they help in the discussion on what videos we'll be releasing in the future. Right place, right time. So whether you're new to sailing or just looking to upgrade, you have to work to land yourself in a position to be offered that great deal on a hidden gem of a boat, the things that never get listed for sale. The man who bought the 31 we were talking about a few minutes ago, at the time he was a crew member at our club and I'll explain what that is. Basically, he volunteered to crew on race nights. More importantly, he showed up. We race every Thursday. He was there every Thursday. And that's important because as a race captain, having consistent crew is the most important thing to me. I can't teach a new person how to trim the jib on my boat every single week. We'll never be competitive that way. So someone who shows up every time is worth his or her weight in gold. And this guy did so much so that he was basically an honorary member of the club anyway, and everybody loved him. Not even owning a boat, he found himself ingrained in the sailing community. And I'm going to use that word a lot, ingrained. People who are ingrained are the people who get invited back to the boat for a beer after the race or to come out for some more family-oriented sailing on the weekend. They get invited to the barbecues and the summer fun days. And once ingrained, all you have to do is mention, even once, that you're looking to buy a boat and the sailors will do the rest, I promise you. Our goal will immediately be to go out and search high and low for a boat for you and we know what's for sale before it's for sale. We know who's thinking about retiring and who doesn't really care about the money that much. And that's how I got Lady K. The wife had fallen ill and the husband couldn't keep up with the boat anymore. It wasn't advertised anywhere, but he wanted about 30000 for it. But it wasn't about the money for those two. It was about the passion that I had for the boat. I mean, the boat is basically famous now, and I've done more miles on it in the last seven years than it did in the previous 40. And you can get ingrained as well. Find your local sailing club and get a crewing membership. 
most of us offer them. And then make yourself available to crew once a week and actually show up. And you can slowly become ingrained in that sailing community. But you'll also, as a side effect, learn a lot about sailing. I always say an hour of racing is equal to about a week of normal sailing. One last boat before we go, and this one is one I'm actually selling for a member of our club. She's a tidy little C&C 25, the Mark I. They made this from the early 70s or the early 80s, and this one's in great shape. It also comes with a Honda 99 Electric Start four-stroke. Now I've taken this boat out and raced it myself, and it sails amazing. It is a C&C after all. It's up for five grand Canadian near Windsor, Detroit. If anyone wants a great little starter boat, I'll leave a link below. It comes with a cradle. Also, if you're boat shopping, I get a lot of requests from people for help. So I dedicated a page over at ladykaysailing.com where you can go to book an hour of my time if it'll be helpful to you. It's ladykaysailing.com forward slash consults. That's it for this week, guys. Please don't hesitate to check out that new channel and let me know what you think. Histercy and subscribe if you like it. Uh, I love you guys so much and I can't wait for summer. I'm genuinely getting really excited now. I'm headed to the boat soon to figure out what work it's going to take to get her ready. Until next week, guys, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. We'll see you.